addiction is really a chronic relapsing disease of the brain. Think of it a little bit like asthma. I think people understand that, chronic relapsing disease of their lungs. Whereas what's happening here, similar problems going on in the brain. And therefore, of course, it's not curable. And what you're attempting to do is to get long periods of time when you're stable and things are going well, and, and hopefully short periods of time when you're not well. Research over the last 10, 15, 20 years have really given us a much better idea of what's happening inside somebody's brain. So if you, if you think of it, we all have a series of particular uh, pathways in our brain. For example, the brain receives messages, interprets them, translates them. And to do that, we need an electrical system and, and a chemical system. And the chemical system is called a transmitter system, which acts on receptors. Drugs, alcohol, latch onto those same sort of receptors and hit them hard. And so what tends to happen is it revs it up. I mean, let's take stimulants, for example, things like cocaine, amphetamines, that sort of thing. They hop into our reward system and they turbocharge it. So it's going faster and faster and faster. And after a while, what happens is you get an imbalance where the drug is driving the reward and your normal control centers aren't working. And I often use when I'm talking to people an expression, it's like a runaway car where the accelerator's stuck and the brake's not working. And most of us wouldn't want to drive that sort of car, but that's what's happening in the brain of an addict. We are all at risk of becoming addictive. We just only, we need to use enough of a drug of addiction and we all will eventually become addicted. However, there are certain people that are at much higher risk. So that, for example, if you have a family history of either drug addiction or alcoholism, you're at higher risk. There's certain personality styles. Uh, the impetuous person, I think that's fairly easy to understand, isn't it? Somebody that's impetuous about most things, if they start using alcohol or drugs, is likely to use it in an accelerated manner. The person with low self-esteem might be using it to bring their esteem up so that they can talk to other people, so they can function. And when they first start using it, it often works well, but then they've got to use more and more. The antisocial person, the person that's not interested in anyone else at all, often uses this to be stable. And there's another group that I call a group of people that really consider themselves better than anyone else. These sort of bulletproof types, you know, nothing can hurt me, I can use this and, let, and nothing much is going to happen. But of course it can creep up on you. So that's two groups, the personality group, the family group, and also people with mental illness. You've probably heard of bipolar disorder, depression. These people often will use drugs to make them feel a bit better and under those circumstances they have to use more and more. Uh, Accessibility, you know, if you're in a family where everybody uses, there's a pub across the road, that's w the way which you socialise, you're at higher risk. Doesn't mean you will get into strife, but you put yourself at higher risk. Mm. Imagine a house full of smokers and a new person comes in and everyone sits around and talks while they smoke. The new person strongly is sort of directed towards that, and this is particularly so with teenagers, of course. Mm. Elite sports people are the sort of people more like to fit into this, uh, I'm bulletproof, uh, nothing can hurt me, uh, you know, tough as nails everywhere. And also often they see themselves as being elite, and they are, but they often see themselves as being better than anyone else as well. And therefore under those circumstances the general rules that other people might have to follow don't necessarily apply to them. So that's the other thing. And of course the other thing is family support. If we look at young people drafted at the age of say 17 or 18 may still be at school they may travel right across the country be living in a different city and they don't have the same stabilizing family supports uh, situations where elite sports people are often pur people purchase drinks for them uh, often offer them drugs so that i think they're in a, in a situation where they're far more likely uh, to get into strife and of course if we if we know about it young people use drugs it doesn't matter whether they're sports people or not so it's part of the general thing that's happening in society it's just that i think the risk under certain, for certain elite sports people is significantly higher. 
I certainly remember when I had a cold as a kid, mum would say, go to bed, take, take a lemon drink. Uh, whereas other families are always taking their, their child to the doctor. So they can start at a much, much earlier age. And you're right, if you're in a situation where you need something for this pain in your knee in order to be able to play, if you need something for your anxiety, instead of sitting down and spending some time and working through the causes of that anxiety and how to deal with it, you can deal with it very rapidly with medication or with alcohol or with drugs and that then becomes a style. I think that's an important point. Mm -hmm. There's varying sort of cultures, isn't there? If you look in, in our community, a multicultural community, often young people come in, they want to become Australian, they want to do what their peers are doing and their parents often haven't got a clue what's going on, plus they can't identify with it. And yes, in a family where uh, it's traditional and they're brought up with certain ways, as soon as uh, the kid starts to buck uh, and every child, every adolescent uh, bucks the system. It's a matter of uh, what I do when I, I'm working with people, I say what things are worth dying in a ditch for and what things do you ignore, the length of the hair, those sort of things and yet some parents get very uptight about that and then the child's rebellion becomes greater and greater and that certainly can lead to drugs because they'll have friends who will offer it to them. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the classical elite sports people that get into strife that way are the swimmers. They start usually at a very early age, they're training before school, they're training after school, they don't get the usual social and emotional maturity step by step by step that occurs in a normal family. And so some of these kids get into their 20s and emotionally they're still 13 or 14. And I think that also makes it much harder for them to deal with social situations. And I can certainly imagine that happening in other elite sports people as well. But the swimmers stand out to me as being at the greatest risk as far as that's concerned. I've worked with 40 year olds who are emotionally teenagers. Uh, they've just spent several decades of drug use and they've not emotionally developed because the drugs actually block the ability to express emotions, to develop emotions, to mature emotions. Everybody's at risk, as I mentioned before. You just have to use enough of the stuff for long enough. But one of the other things that you might say is the reason that people use. And so while most folks start to be part of a group, to enjoy themselves, to get a reward, if more and more you have to start using this drug to feel normal, to get a relief of either what we call emotional pain, distress, anxiety or things like that, you're at a much, much greater risk of becoming addicted uh, than the, the person who might just have a drink on a Friday night after work uh, or maybe when they go to the football on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, so that's certainly one, what we might call an early morning uh, warning sign. And the other thing is uh, mental illness such as depression. But depression is actually quite common among teenagers. I think a lot of it is underdiagnosed. And a kid who's depressed that wants to become part of their, their peer group will often, if they start drinking or using drugs, use them to a much greater extent and end up becoming um, addicted. So there's uh, many, many pathways actually in to an addiction. The, the beautiful thing is that majority of people don't. They, they mature through that stage, they might use for a little while uh, and then they might give it up or they might drink heavily for a short period of time and then they give it up and become adults. But within that group there's a small group in which it, the addiction just develops and once they're hooked into it they can't uh, do much about it because the brain now becomes hypersensitive. So it's a bit like these receptors have got antennae sticking up there just looking for the drug or for the alcohol and as soon as it comes past they latch onto it. And so the person starts to feel that they actually need it rather than it just being something that they might use. Let's think of a hobby you might enjoy, like playing tennis, right? Now most of us, unless we're professional tennis players, might play for an hour or so and enjoy it and then say we've had enough. You know, the control comes in, like the brake comes in and says, that's enough for today. Most of us enjoy eating, but most of us don't sit down and eat hour after hour after hour. This little message gets to the brain, I've had enough. So that's this balance between reward and control. I mean, it's in every human being and, it, and it's what keeps generations going. 
But when that gets out of hand, so in that where you've got the reward uh, driven, 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 many of these drugs not only overwhelm it, but some of them also inhibit the control part of your brain as well. So you've got a drug which is forcing one and putting the other to sleep. And for let's take a cocaine or an amphetamine addict, when they stop, it takes at least three months for the control uh, part of the brain to start to kick in. And, and uh, it's still not really fully back to what it should be in s six months or more. So you can see that people, when they stop, unless they're very well supported, are at huge risk of relapsing again and going right back to what they were doing before. Um, and many folks don't realise that. They think all they've got to do is stop and then everything's going to be perfectly okay. But it isn't so in the brain of an addict. Now, we've been talking about the good news so far, about things that are reversible once you, uh, once you stop. And uh, that sort of is the, ni the nice news. But as I said, it takes a while. And sometimes it may take up to two years before that will completely repair and come back to normal. Unfortunately, when you've gone a long way down that track, then some things are not reversible. We take alcohol, for example. If you have damaged brain cells, if you've got into fights and had head trauma while you're drinking heavily, you can end up with permanent damage and problems with uh, memory. Uh, with the, uh, the stimulants, such as cocaine and amphetamines, these drive your heart and drive your blood pressure and they can cause little strokes by bleeding into your brain. So uh, not the sort of big stroke, usually, that, that uh, uh, an elderly person might get. But they, you may have trouble with your vision, you may have trouble uh, with your sensation, you may have trouble with your speech. And these sort of things can happen, particularly if you're on a binge in using some of these drugs. You can get heat stroke from those same particular drugs and you can get a heart attack as well. So, you know, it's so sad when you see somebody in their teenagers, 20s or even 30s that physically and mentally uh, have been uh, damaged uh, irreversibly. The problem that we have as a society with methamphetamine is that uh, it's it, a form of amphetamine which is in a crystal form so it's dissolved fairly easily so you can inject it or you can snort it and also when you crystallize something you can get it in much purer form so while unit for unit it's no stronger than any of the other uh, amphetamines the fact that you can get a much purer substance is a trouble. I think we're going to have a problem with uh, long-term memory with uh, some of these uh, uh, people and therefore learning. If you start using this again as a young person, if in your 30s you want to advance in your job and learn something new, you may struggle with, uh, with that sort of thing. Providing, of course, you get through the addiction and, be and that being a highly addictive drug, people die from taking it and that's the other thing that we just need to be aware of. If you go to meetings of people like Narcotics Anonymous and Alcohol Anonymous, they would say denial is one of the most uh, common defence mechanisms that addicts use. And so quite often uh, an addict will not accept that they're in, in strife. But if they look back over what's happened, it's a stage where their control over the use of it starts to become impaired. Let's take alcohol, for example, and you go out with a few mates and by 10 o'clock most people have had enough and they're ready to go home and go to bed. But the person who still wants to keep drinking and are willing to continue to drink by themselves is clearly somebody who's started on that path of addiction. Uh, the person that uh, is still drinking when everyone else is sound asleep, they're highly tolerant. And also the person who every time they try to stop, they find that they can't. Or if they do stop, they go into severe withdrawal. So impaired control, high levels of tolerance and going into withdrawal. And the subtle uh, early thing is really this impaired control. Um, family will often notice it by changes in behaviour, irritability, uh, mood change, and very commonly giving up the things they used to enjoy. Uh, once somebody becomes addicted, uh, the drug, the alcohol is so pervasive that their hobbies are given up. Uh, they don't socialise as much with their friends, far more interested in, uh, in drinking or using. Uh, and that's often a, uh, a clue uh, that something not so good is happening.
If we go back in history, this was seen as a moral problem and uh, the preachers from the pulpits were the, the only people that were interested in addictions. Then it became a legal problem and it's taken a long while for us to realise that it is both a social and a health problem. Think of maybe your friends have given up smoking. They probably had four or five goes before they finally managed to do it. And that's the same. Think of somebody who has a severe asthma attack and goes to hospital. They just get treated once they're not going to uh, be perfectly okay. They're going to relapse again unless they change their lifestyle. And that's one of the very key things that's required. What we call a behavior change. You need some substitute activities. You need to do things that will replace the time that you spent on your drinking or your drug use. You need a different attitude and a mindset. And in fact, you've got to unlearn. And that's often one of the most difficult things. And that's usually why counselors, addiction medicine doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists are needed to guide somebody through that unlearning process. It's really like a teacher guiding you. The person's got to do the work, but the teacher can let you know whether you're heading in the, whether you're opening the book at the right chapter or whether you're heading in the right direction. Yeah. So it's a lot of effort yeah. and medicine, medicines can help, but they only play a tiny bit of the rehabilitation process actually. There are a group of drugs are what we call anti-craving drugs because when you get, your brain gets out of balance and, and, and many people describe it as a chemical imbalance in a way that's what it is, this one's going and this one's not working. These are drugs that can reduce the cravings or can bring this thing back into balance. They are not however the ones we've got on the market powerful enough to do it by itself. Um, when I work with uh, people, particularly in group therapy, I say, unless you climb the hill, uh, you're not going to get on top of this. It's no good someone else carrying a pack. You, you've uh, got to actually climb the hill to get there. And that's one of these things. These medications can help by controlling cravings, by starting to readjust. But remember, I said it takes months and months and months for the control system to come back. And so unless you're working through the new skills, the new behavior change, the new you, um, you'll slip right back again. And your brain will just go back to what it knew before. I often call it uh, using old solutions for new problems. Uh, and that's pretty much uh, uh, puts it in a nutshell. Can't be cured, not in, in our current understanding. Just the same as asthma, diabetes, high blood pressure, arthritis are not curable diseases, but they're all controllable diseases. And certainly addictions can be controlled just as well. Uh, it needs a lot of work on behalf of the person and it needs support. And there's two lots of support. There's professional support, which is critical for most people, but there's social support. And this is where the family is important. And sometimes the family unwittingly feeds the addiction rather than supports the person through it. And uh, often in family therapy, that's what we've got to try and teach people to do. The, in AA, they call it tough love. You love the person, but you don't love the behavior that's going on. And then the, those, what we call self-help organizations, they're not really treatment, but they're an important part of that uh, self-help. And particularly in young people where they don't have a family to help them. Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous are groups where people have gone through all this before. But they know where the problems are, they know how they got through it, and they're often very supportive. And of course, there are also family supports as well. Things like Al-Anon is one for the family of people with alcoholics, and al for the children of alcoholics. So there's a lot of support groups out there. And for some people, that's just the little bit they need to understand their family member who has the addiction better and to ensure that they're not feeding the addiction and they're actually looking after themselves. Because the last thing you want is for the person to come through their addiction in four or five years and the family's been destroyed in the meanwhile. I think one of the best examples is what's happened with the Beyond Blue program that publicized that depression was a mental illness and it's not something that should be shamed of, not something you should hide from. And when prominent people came out, sometimes politicians, sometimes elite sports people, who said, yes, I've been depressed, but I've come through it and this is what I've done. Uh, that gives people hope. 
and that that reduces the stigma. We've still got a long way to go with mental illness, but we've got a lot further to go with addictions. I think there's large groups of society that really don't understand addictions at all, maybe don't want to understand addictions as well. And I think a lot of our public education, and I'd like to see the government put some more money into that, as they have done with uh, mental illness, to try and reduce this uh, um, stigma and shame so people will uh, be far more likely to come to treatment. Take alcohol for example, the overwhelming majority of people that use alcohol use it in a safe way, right Alan? But the newspaper doesn't write up 60% of the population are using this in a safe way, does it? It, it emphasises the other problems. And so one of the things is that we need to be patient enough to listen to that education and it needs to be a little bit of time and continuous over time so people can take it in. We can start in the school system, we can, can continue it through. And yes, it doesn't mean that you accept that high levels of drug use is going to happen, but you do accept that this is part of human nature. Alcohol has been around for 6,000 years, right? It's not going to suddenly go away. And other drugs come and go, and uh, they're going to be there, and p young people will experiment. That's a reality. But what we've got to do is support them through it, show them that there are better things to do with their life, and uh, we haven't talked a lot about prevention because uh, that's another sort of thing, the family that is supportive and I think one of the beautiful things about sport, not necessarily sport in the elite level, but young people being involved in sport is that it makes them feel better physically, they've got a group of young people around them that are often well and highly motivated to do the best they can. Um, the same thing with the spiritual life, there's far, far less drug use and that in a group of people that have a spiritual concept and have a family with a spiritual concept. So different people can do it different ways, but it's the same in terms of, I think, the need for a lot more prevention in this area as well. And education is part of that prevention. One can't point fingers because you don't actually know what happened, but if a peer or um, a significant other, and we'll say not family, because the family don't understand, start to realise that this is happening, the earlier that you intervene, uh, the better. And it may well be that what's happened is that he'd been using for quite some time before anybody cottoned on to the fact that this was a significant problem. And of course, the further you are down that track, the harder it is clearly to come back. Young people these days use websites, don't they? And the Australian Drug Foundation, um, I think it's uh, adf.org, something like that, is uh, an excellent source of material that's designed actually for, for the public, for the students and for families. So in fact they have, they say this is for families, this is for this, this is that group. So that's one very important source. Um, the, some schools do it extremely well. They have enthusiastic teachers, often do it as part of the science stream. Uh, but again, the teacher has to be trained and comfortable in, in dealing with this sort of material. Uh, that's another particular place. Uh, there are some general practitioners that are, have taken this up as a special interest. And so that, you know, if parents take their kids along to them at a particular time, they can be supportive in that sort of uh, system. And uh, there uh, are other organisations, uh, the, the federal government organisations, again, that's got websites that has got information. But certainly I think the Australian Drug Foundation is the one that I'd recommend that people would start with. And they have one that's very acceptable to young people. It's called Somazone, S-O-M-A-Z-O-N-E. Uh, so that you've got things for parents, things for kids, and th things for, uh, for the general public. One of the critical things clearly is that if somebody is highly motivated to do something then they are easier to support and to put it in very simple terms, you use a carrot and you use a stick. Uh, most doctors I don't think could take up bricklaying or carpentry or something else if they were no longer registered to be a doctor. So one of the things that we do with uh, what we call impaired doctors, doctors that have problems with substances, is we ask them to stop work, 
until we get the problem sorted out. They may have to go into a withdrawal unit. They certainly need an assessment by a series of specialists, an addiction medicine specialist and psychiatrist, GP to make sure their physical health is sorted out because quite often when you've been using for a while you ignore your physical health. Once we've got that all together, we work out a plan and we ask the doctor to sign an agreement with us that they will only go back to work when uh, their treating doctors are comfortable with that and that they will observe certain things. So that, for example, uh, if you take an example of an anaesthetist. When an anaesthetist goes back to work, if they had a drug use problem, they would have to agree that there's somebody at the workplace who is willing to monitor them and report to us if they're problems. And that may be the nurse they work with, it may be their immediate boss, or it may be both of those. We'd also drug test them. Uh, urine testing and hair testing we would use. We would have groups for them to come, doctors only. It's pretty hard for a doctor to go to an AA or an NA group and some of their patients might be there. So we've got special groups for, the, for doctors alone. And we monitor them for four or five years. Now with that sort of program, we get something like 85% of them back to work. Some of them die along the way, some of them retire, some of them, their, their illness gets worse. But 85% is a much, much, much better way than we get trying to manage people who are not highly motivated, who come into treatment, go out of treatment, come into treatment, go out of treatment. Uh, and they're the sort of models because we have to protect the public. Uh, from an impaired doctor and so we want to be able to assure people that your doctor will only be working when he or she is well enough to do it. Elite sports people are probably far, far more worried about um, privacy and confidentiality than even uh, doctors are. I think it would be a good model, um, but it's, it's very intensive over a prolonged period of time and I can see people bucking on it, but if someone said to me, if you had to design a system, what would you do? Uh, I think we've got a model that works that we would be very happy to, uh, to roll out. One of the things with complete zero tolerance is, first of all, it doesn't work. The Americans introduced prohibition in 1920, 20s. It took them 12 years to work out it didn't work, and in the meanwhile, they gave the mafia the greatest shot in the arm, so that when they came through that, they had control of the, the liquor trade, the drug trade, the prostitution trade. Uh, human nature is such that we will always want to use something. Do you drink coffee? I do. That certainly could be considered a very weak psychoactive uh, drug. Don't know too many people get dependent on, but, it, but we're using a stimulant. Uh, one of the things that I like about the, the policy of the AFL is that it recognises that people can get into a mess perhaps through very little fault of their own. For example, uh, I have a strong uh, belief that most people uh, that st uh, start u using drugs that might then be picked up on drug testing probably do it while under the influence of alcohol so that their judgment's impaired. So are we then going to ban that guy from life? because he makes a stupid mistake, shouldn't have done it, but makes a stupid mistake, maybe at the age of 18 or 19. Um, and I think the real advantage of that is that it's a chance to pull that person out to get them back on track. Uh, the advantage, I think, of three strikes is there's going to be a small number of people that are a bit slower to learn or that, uh, through no fault of their own, in fact, uh, may consume something that they're not aware that they're actually consuming it. Uh, if, if you get two strikes, I think those people will be rigidly aware and if they're, they're highly motivated to keep playing and not to use drugs, will be just so careful that the risk is just not there. I think the three strike people, if we look at some of the other codes, the American code and others, they're actually people that are addicted in, in fact and that they usually in the American scene uh, get in because of violent incidents. They actually get into fights and other things like that and that's often the thing in which the drug use becomes uh, uh, more obvious. The biggest challenge with any elite sportsman returning to the game uh, is uh, I think uh, several fold. One is an injury. 
uh, soon after you go back could absolutely shatter your confidence and if you're then sitting around for months and months going through rehab the risk of relapse is higher. I think that the sort of bulletproof type um, uh, elite sportsman is not going to be worried by niggling and taggers and people like that on the field. I don't think the field is the problem at all. The culture of the club I think is very important and different clubs have different cultures and so if you have a high drug using culture or, or a high drinking culture in a club then, then anybody who's addicted is at, at much higher risk that that's likely to happen. The sort of support around you, the family support, if you've got either very close friends that you can unwind with without having to use drugs, if you've got family members that you can unwind with without having to use drugs, then that's great. But if you're isolated, you're by yourself, you're living in a flat and, and the only group of friends you've got are uh, people that drink or, dr or use drugs, then the risk is much higher. And also I suspect that uh, you know certain people will target uh, somebody who's known to have had a drug trouble in the past because they want to make big name themselves. If I can get this guy to use then I can sell my story to the media and I'll be big time among my friends. So I think that's where the, the risks are. I don't believe the risks at all are playing football unless it's an injury. I think the risks really relate to the culture around it and the support or lack of support around it.